This is a Silver Bullet Security Podcast with Gary McGraw. I'm your host, Gary McGraw, CTO of Sigital and author of Software Security. This podcast series is co-sponsored by Sigital and IEEE Security and Privacy Magazine. For more, see www.computer.org slash security and www.sigital.com slash silver bullet. This is the 116th in a series of interviews with security gurus, and I'm super pleased to have today with me, Doug Mon. Hey, Doug. Hey, Gary. How you doing? I'm good. Thanks for joining us from Utah. Doug Mon is CSD Division Director in HSARPA within the Science and Technology Directorate of the Department of Homeland Security. Doug directs cyber research and development at HSARPA. Prior to his work at DHS, Doug was at DARPA as a program manager in the Advanced Technology Office. I think I first met Doug when he was at DARPA. Doug also worked for the NSA as a senior computer scientist. Doug did his undergrad work at Utah State, earned a master's in CS from Johns Hopkins, and a PhD from UMBC. That's the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Doug lives in Maryland with his family, and he is currently calling in from southern Utah. So thanks for joining us, Doug. Thanks again, Gary. Uh, let's talk about science and the important role that government funding plays in supporting academia and, you know, kind of hard-edged science. You spent time at DARPA, and now you're at HSARPA, funding mostly early-stage science and some, I guess, tech transfer activities. Which projects that you funded do you think were the most important over your career of doing this sort of thing? I think there have been a lot of them have been, you know, significant. I think, uh, for starters, probably the more impactful one that people don't actually see is uh, some of the work we funded in at DARPA, and we're doing some work in this area as well in uh, distributed denial of service defense technology. So a company like Arbor Networks, which is still one of the you know staple companies uh, for DDoS defense, was some based on work I funded uh, 15, 16 years ago. Uh, even though DDoS hasn't gone away. Um, We've still made a pretty significant dent in the in the problem, and now it's getting you know it's kind of getting worse again. And we've started to fund some additional work in this area, looking at solutions to defend against a DDoS to a 911 center or you know other critical infrastructure. So I think that's a key area that has impact on everyone. Yeah, that's great. That's a perfect example. Um, anything else come to mind? Well, you know, as you know, Gary, we've been behind the district, uh, domain name system security and the DNSSEC initiative for the last decade. Um, I think we're still waiting for the killer app for DNSSEC, but <laughs> you know, we've gotten uh, we've gotten global, almost global, you know, understanding and a lot of deployment of DNS security. We're now doing very similar things with routing security with the routing public key infrastructure and security for the border gateway protocol. Again, all of which is a, is a global piece of cybersecurity that, you know, while everybody doesn't have to implement it, it does have global impact. Yeah, and that's I think sort of invisible is the cool way of putting it. it. it, it yeah, yeah, it, it's, you know, just like the air and water, we kind of need security of cyberspace uh, and people not even, you know, don't want them to even notice it. So one of the biggest challenges that everybody in technology faces um, who has even a, a, a pinky in science land is this notion of tech transfer. Um, so how, in your view, does tech transfer really work, and how long does it really take? You know, that's, uh, you know, learned a lot of lessons about tech transfer. I think what people don't understand is we, we often spend 80% of the money on the science, and leave 10 or 20 percent to try to transition and in fact uh, the work factor is about the exact opposite it takes 20 percent of the work to do the to do the science and the and the research and it takes 80 percent of the work to actually transition it and commercialize it um, it's a lot harder than people ever think because there are so many um, aspects to transitioning and commercializing one of the things that I think I learned at DARPA that I then transitioned over to DHS was this issue of transition and most researchers don't think about transition until well down the 
the timeline of their research. Mm -hmm. And so what we did at DHS uh, and have been doing for 12 years now is when we do solicitations, we require, again, at DHS, we're not really doing basic science. It's, it's applied through transition, but we, when we do solicitations, we require a significant part of that proposal to be about the transition and what the commercial opportunities are, and that's a significant evaluation criteria because if it doesn't have commercial potential and the ability to, to make it into the market, we're less likely to fund that research because uh, you know gone are the days of just funding research and having it sit on the shelf. Yeah, that's that's interesting. But the real question is, you know, if you have a good scientist, can they actually do tech transfer? <laughs> because, uh, you know, I know a lot of really excellent academics who publish great papers and they do great work, but I don't think that they could build a product to save their life or even pitch something to a VC. And and so what do you do about that? So, you know, we, we've seen plenty of scientists who... Uh, don't want to be entrepreneurs, yeah, and that's fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've uh, There's a separate program we've initiated. It came out of the White House uh, Comprehensive National Cybersecurity Initiative called Transition to Practice, where we have engaged with VCs, with uh, angel funders, with uh, incubators, and worked to bring technology out of the labs, out of the hands of the scientists, that they're not going to be an entrepreneur, and been able to license those technologies uh, or, or make those technologies available for open source um, such that we've been able to get the technologies out of the labs and into the into the market. Is that sort of an Incutel model, kind of? It's a little different than Incutel in the sense that uh, we're still earlier stage when we're doing that compared mm. to the Incutel model, which is a later stage approach. Right. Um, so let's talk about you know what some people call the research valley of death. Do you think that the research value of death is real? I mean, we've sort of been addressing it, so I think the answer is yes. But, you know, what's your experience with that? Yeah, it, it certainly is. And, in fact, um, we, as I said, we oftentimes put way more money into the research piece than, than we do into the transition piece. And, in fact, you know, the, the harder part is that time frame between um, – when you've done the research and you've done some development, but you've been uh, unsuccessful in getting the technology more mature, getting the technology into uh, pilots or uh, red teamed or you know you know customer deployments, and and people don't understand that you know it, that that takes time, that takes a lot of work, and that's not research, and it's also you know they're not quite product yet either. So yeah. there's a uh, a fair amount of effort that needs to go in there, and that all takes a little bit of money, too. So that's another thing we actively fund is those kinds of activities to try to help the entrepreneur or the researcher uh, along the commercialization path. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, you know, I think you sat on the jury once or twice when we did um, Department of Commerce Advanced Technology Program stuff a million years yep. ago at, at Sigital. Um, and that was one way to get across the research valley of death, but it was politically difficult. Um, in fact, some people called that corporate welfare, <laughs> I remember. Um, and the whole idea of, you know, uh, transitioning stuff from the lab to VCs came as a foreign thought because, they, you know, people figure VCs would just pick up any shiny object and, and fund it, but that's just not the case. Um, and that, that's, yeah, that is not the, that is not the case, yeah. and they're... And they're not going to actually invest in uh, those technologies that are in the Valley of Death. The VCs are only going to invest in the technology that are that, that are just crossed the Valley of Death yep. and starting down a commercialization path where they can see a big return on investment. Yep. But it's it's getting it to a point where it's actually in front of them that they will make that investment and. And that's a long path yep. from where the research was. So, you know, one of the disturbing things that's happened lately, I guess since the recession really, is that the amount of money being poured into basic science by the government has actually gone down about 3% um, across the board. And this, this is if you count even the medical research, NIH stuff and everything. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. and I, I think those numbers. I think those numbers might even be low. If 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 you actually look at the trend, you know, from the seventies and eighties, it used to be seventy percent government funded on research and thirty percent private sector, uh-huh. and that's almost completely flipped now. I mean, yeah. the government is twenty to thirty percent of the funding of research and and on a downward trend, which I think is uh, a little bit disturbing. I think that's incredibly disturbing. As you know, a member of an advanced society building the best tech. We need to do more of that. So my opinion is the government should be doing way more basic research and not less and shouldn't be leaving it to the private sector. You share that opinion? I, I do share that opinion, and I think it's certainly the case in the higher tech fields and in, the, in this case in the cybersecurity realm because of the rapid pace of change of the technology uh, and the innovation that's happening. I think it's even more important that we are putting more money into this to, to spur the innovation that needs to happen. Okay, so so we'll establish more basic research should happen at the government, but then we got that valley of death thing, and the question is whether the corporate world should be reaching back through the valley of death um, and pushing things along to the, to the kind of VC-ready level. Um, should the private sector be doing that, or is that a government job too? I think there's, you know, every technology is going to be a little bit different, and I think there are numerous models that you can use. Um, in some cases, the government can help push that along, depending upon the technologies where there might not be a big market. For, for example, uh, in technologies to support law enforcement, mm-hmm. uh, which we worry we worry about at DHS, yep. that's not a big market. There's not going to be a lot of investors because that's not a you know, generic IT solution that's going to be specific to law enforcement. So, so government has to put a little bit more money in there to make that uh, more successful. But if it's, you know, generic IT kinds of things, then certainly the private sector should be reaching back and co-investing or, or even making some investments. And I think you're starting to see, you know, some of the critical infrastructure sectors and more and more, um, you know, larger companies taking advantage of the government-funded R&D at an earlier stage than they have in the past. Uh Uh-huh. That's good. We'll be right back after this message. This is Gary McGraw, your host for the Silver Bullet Security Podcast. If you like what you're hearing here, you should check out my monthly security column published by Search Security and Information Security Magazine. You can find the most recent column at searchsecurity.com slash McGraw, all of my writings are collected on my webpage at www.sigital.com slash gem slash writings. Thanks for listening. So let's switch gears a little bit. Um, this is a slightly difficult subject. So academic computer security efforts, kind of like Fred Schneider's science of security stuff, are almost wholly disconnected with the kind of... Um, Security Operations Center, Network Operations Center, operational security, mostly practiced in the government. Like there's a world of difference between those things. Why? So I think it's in large measure, you know, you can blame anybody you want, but I think in large measure it tends to be back to our conversation earlier about transition. You know, many of the academic researchers who are doing that basic science uh, that, that's what they want to do, and they're not worried about the transition. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, in large measure, it's up to the government to determine what things coming out of there have uh, significant relevance and continue to fund them past the basic science and into the applied and the development and transition activities. Well, so, let's, let's, you know, I think, let's talk about something slightly different. So, I'm not thinking mostly yep. about tech transfer. Um, instead, I'm thinking, why is the government sometimes missing the boat when technology has been transferred out um, that the government invented, <laughs> um, but it's not being picked up by maybe the contractors or the uh, subcontractors who are doing operational security? And so that sort of leaves the government behind, say, in security engineering or software security or any of the stuff we've been I've been focused on for the yeah. last 20 years. Yeah, and I think there's so, there's always this, you know, the government will oftentimes be uh, an early adopter of some technologies from a test and evaluation perspective, but uh-huh. they seem to be a slower a slower buyer 
from an acquisition perspective. Uh -huh. And that's, you know, that's a, an acquisition piece, but I think there is also this awareness piece that, that the government's not even aware of um, those technologies that are coming out of the academic space, but they still maybe not, are not mature enough to be into the commercial space. And that's where I think the government has a role, and one of the roles that DHS tries to play is, you know, I, I count on the National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy and, and other agencies who fund basic research yep. to produce the outputs that I can use as inputs into the programs that we run. Got so, it. you know, we're not worried about basic science. We're worried about taking the, you know, somebody's already done two or three years' worth of research. We know what the, the cool ideas are. Let's take them the next step. Let's carry them down the, the field another 10 or 20 or 30 yards mm -hmm. um, towards commercialization and transition. And I just don't think we, the government, do enough of that. No, it's kind of funny. It's kind of like, you know, the government makes some really nice, nutritious dog food and fails to eat it. <laughs> well, and sometimes, uh, you know, there's danger in doing that, too. Yeah. Um, you know, if it's, if it's – and we're seeing, I think, more and more cost products, certainly in the DHS perspective – we buy COTS. We're very rarely doing, you know, GOTS, right. government off the shelf, right. because it's not, it's not sustainable. You you uh, you pay a lot more for something that uh, that is GOTS than you do for something that you can get in the commercial marketplace. Yeah, that makes total sense. But then but then you end up, you know, with some contractors putting ridiculous cross site scripting bugs that we could have found yep. in our sleep automatically in the '90s. In fact, you. Yeah. funded research to not make that stuff go away automatically and yet the same department you know i guess the government's just so darn big it's difficult it, it is and and uh you know again some of the technologies that the government's buying is you know five to ten years old right and that's an eternity that's right we don't always uh, in this area don't always put the, the bleeding edge technology into operation yeah. Um, let's talk about open source for, for a minute. You've been sure. a huge proponent of open source and security. Uh, and, you know, you funded a lot of open source stuff and, and caused a lot of people to build things that were then open source, which is pretty cool. Um, but in light of the Heartbleed stuff and other spectacular failures in open source, are you still a big open source proponent? And what do you think we can do to ascertain the security of a piece of open source stuff so yes i'm still a huge believer in open source i think it's just another model another avenue for getting the technology out there and commercialized you know i i'm one of those that believes that open source doesn't necessarily mean it's more or less secure than proprietary solutions i still believe there are places where open source um, is a good solution or a better solution mm -hmm. as you know We've had a you know, number of successes. I think our most uh, uh, successful activity in open source was the Suricata work with the uh, OpenIDS IPS system that we funded back in 2007 to 2010, mm -hmm. and it's still out. And you know, the key there was getting the vendors you know, to, to take the code and put it into their product, and the licensing was uh, favorable. So I think there's a number of avenues we need to think about to continue to make open source more useful one is the licensing issue always trips people up yeah, and you need yeah. to make sure that uh, that's clear yeah i think there is um, um uh, other things you can do uh, you may be familiar with our software assurance marketplace which is a an open and available um software testing facility that includes a lot of uh tools for software testing and you know the Heartbleed was, you know, not a, it, it was a resource issue. It wasn't an, an intentional uh, problem. And, and I, what I've discovered is more and more of the researchers just don't have the resources available to them um, to test their software or right. don't want to take time. And I think, you know, so tools to help make things um, better so we don't have the heart bleeds in the future uh, is another piece where DHS is spending a fair amount of resources. Yeah, and tools are important, but I always like to say a fool with a tool is still a fool. <laughs> that, 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 is, that is true, and, and maybe a fool with a whole bunch of tools isn't quite as big a fool. <laughs> You're always such an optimist, Doug. <laughs> I, you know, I th think it's the optimism you grew up with out there in the vowel state areas. <laughs> 
Um, so you have a cyber PhD and many years of academic training. What are your thoughts about professional certifications? You ever thought about that? Yeah, I think about it all the time. You know, that's all part of the educational piece, and I think we're woefully behind in our education and our training. Um, we're seeing it now, and, you know, it's not just the U.S. Every country I've been to in the last three years, you know, every government is worried about their education and their training and their next generation of cyber professionals. Do we have to have certifications? I, I think certifications are good. I think they prove that people have some amount of knowledge. You know, are, are they the silver bullet to solve all of our problems? No. But, you know, I think it has to be part of the equation. Mm -hmm. And um, you, you have to, but, but we have to make sure that people, you know, have some basic skills, can work in the field, continue to get increase. I mean, this is not a field where you can just get your degree or get your certification and then stop. Um, technology is advancing so rapidly, you really have to stay, you know, buried in the, the area in, in order to, to even keep up. And, uh, but I think, you know, the professional certifications are just one piece of the puzzle, and, and I think they're good, and I think they're useful, um, as are, you know, just hands-on experience is another, you know, great way, and not everybody likes to get those certifications or thinks they're useful, but I still think, uh, you know, there are plenty of things we have to show education and training going forward. I sort of think about it like the medical domain. You know, we need some brain surgeons, we need some regular surgeons, we need some general practitioner medical doctors, we need some nurses, and we need a whole bunch of EMTs, way more. Um, and, and those people have different levels of training, degrees, certifications, and so on. And in some sense, I think, you know, computer security is in the same boat. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think that's a very good analogy for, uh, you know, because we got people who need to be hardware specialists and network specialists and, uh, you know, malware analysts, same kind of model. Um, the question is, you know, how important are those certifications? And, and I suspect, you know, the medical field had probably 100, 100 years uh, on us um, from where the cybersecurity is, and maybe maybe in 100 years we'll be as mature as the medical field. Yeah, I think we're still sawing off uh, limbs with a saw, yeah. basically. Yeah, I, th <laughs> I think you're probably right. <laughs> that kind of hurts. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. Civil War surgeon level achieved. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. So, so quickly discuss two or three of the programs you're currently funding now at HSARPA. I think your budget's now something like $70 million a year. Is that right? Uh, it's a little higher than that, but pretty close, yeah. Uh -huh. it's, in the, it's in the 80 to 90 range, but yeah. That's great. That's a far um, cry from the, I remember, you know, being on your advisory board maybe 15 years ago when you just got started. 2003, yeah. was it? Yeah, it was 2003. Yes, it was, yeah. And the budget was $7 yeah. million. <laughs> so that's a yeah. big change. Yeah. We, we've grown the program, and it's, you know, we think we're uh, doing some cutting-edge stuff, and we're... Uh, you know, having an impact uh, not only uh, locally but globally, uh, you know, doing a lot of work internationally. Um, I think I would probably highlight three or four programs for you, Gary, that I think are key. One, as you know, is at the core of everything is software, and uh, software vulnerabilities continue to plague us. Uh, we have a suite of programs that are being run in the software assurance area. You may have seen a couple of our solicitations that just came out uh, last week on um, uh, software static tool modernization project where we're trying to up our game on the static tools. Um, and another one in um, uh, application security testing. And, and um, so I think, you know, at the core of everything is software. Uh, we still don't have good software development tools, um, you know, as well as they should be. It all ties into our, our model to use the software assurance marketplace. So I, I think, you know, that's a key piece for us software's at the core of, of everything. We need to try, try to do a better job in building better software. All I have to say about second, that is hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, and you know, Gary, it, it's a, it's, and it's still not enough, right? I mean, uh, we could spend another order of magnitude in funding, and we still won't find all the, fix all the software bugs, but, but we really need more people paying attention to this. And, and more importantly, back to the education piece, we actually need to fix our educational system to be teaching this software security much earlier in the pipeline um, than we are today. 
Yep. So I think there's there's all kinds of things we can do to fix software. Yep, I agree with all area, those things. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I knew you would. <laughs> the um, the second area that I think is key for for us is you know everything online is about identity, and uh, we don't have good systems and solutions for identity management and to be able to tell you know, who, who you are online. You know, the old cartoon of the 70s that says, you know, nobody knows you're a dog on the Internet. Yeah, yeah. It's actually still, it's still valid. It's still true. And part of that uh, identity is what would help us in the attribution piece uh, for those people doing bad things online. And uh, so there have been, you know, several analogies of, you know, Internet driver's licenses and all those kinds of things that but at the core of it, it's still, uh, it's still an identity problem. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, our ability to do that. So we've got uh, some new work going on there on the identity side, hopefully be able to make some uh, impact there. A third area that I would like to just focus on, I think, is this whole area of cyber physical systems and the security of that and, you know, kind of Internet of Things, you know, more and more connected devices. You know, we're looking at everything from automotive uh, security, medical devices, building systems, uh, aircraft, etc. all of all of these things that didn't used to be connected but now are, yep. and uh, how do we, you know, build security into some of the future designs of these systems working with, you know, auto manufacturers and their suppliers. So I think that's a key area for us as we look at, you know, the security uh, of the future, all of these devices that are going to be out there, um, how, do you, how do you make sure they can be protected and not compromised? and so I think that's another key area that that uh, we're we've just initiated a new program in last year, and uh, doing some interesting work. And our fourth one that I would just uh, touch on is um, mobile security. So you know, we're leading um, the department in in trying to put you know mobile solutions into the government. Um, you know we're not starting fresh. We're using commercial product. You know the commercial market is so, so large, but the question is how do we add some additional capability to make it useful, more usable by government, and still more secure. And uh, so DHS is in a very leading position, uh, and s and is leading the department in this space and uh, trying to push it out as, across the entire federal government. So I think you know, mobile's uh, here to stay, and we've got to make sure we've got security solutions that are acceptable to government that um, might be a little higher security than your commercial market would, uh, would worry about, but we need to... Uh, be be thinking about that from a government perspective. Yeah, very nice. Well, listen, you know, it's been a, a great conversation, and I gotta say, your persistence um, doing this stuff over many years is greatly appreciated. So, thanks for sticking with it, Doug. Thank you very much, Gary. It's good to talk to you. So, I got one last question for you, which is a doozy. Sure. Um, who's the best all-around baseball player, non-pitcher in the history of the game? You know. <clears throat> That's a tough question, and it, it, um, I, I'm going to have to go with, because I'm an Orioles fan, uh, I think it's got to be Cal Ripken. There you go. Yeah, that was quick. That was quick. You're quick on the draw. I know you're a baseball guy. <laughs> well, well, I was debating between Cal Ripken and Derek Jeter, and uh, I'm not a Yankees fan, but Derek was a great player, um, but i got to go with Cal. There you go. Well, thanks for your time. It's been great. Thank, thanks so much, Gary. Take care. This has been a Silver Bullet Security Podcast with Gary McGraw. Silver Bullet is co-sponsored by Sigital and IEEE Security and Privacy Magazine and syndicated by Search Security. The September-October 2015 issue of IEEE S&P Magazine is devoted to the economics of cybersecurity. The issue features our interview with European cryptographer Bart Perneal. Show links, notes, and an online discussion can be found on the Silver Bullet webpage at www.sigital.com slash silver bullet. This is Gary McGraw.